Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! I've been a cashier here for about two years. You see all sorts at this job, but nothing, and I mean nothing, could have prepared me for Karen. That Tuesday started like any other. I clocked in, donned my mask, you know, the usual COVID precautions, and took my place behind the register. The morning rush was in full swing, with folks grabbing their coffee and breakfast items. It was around 10 a.m. when she walked in. Karen, how do I describe her? Imagine every entitled person stereotype crammed into one person. That's Karen for you. She was in her mid-40s, sporting a can-I-speak-to-the-manager haircut, and she wasn't wearing a mask. The store policy was clear, no mask, no service. So I praised myself as she approached my register, her cart overflowing with groceries. Good morning, ma'am. I agreed, trying to keep things polite. I need to ask you to wear a mask in the store. Karen's eyes narrowed. I will not wear a mask. They are government employees to control us. I sighed inwardly. One of those anti-maskers. I'm sorry, ma'am, but it's store policy. I can't check you out without a mask. And the standoff began. Karen started ranting about her rights, how the virus was a hoax, and throwing every conspiracy theory she'd apparently read on the internet at me. I stood my ground repeating the store policy. Then, out of nowhere, she pulled out a can of pepper spray. If you won't serve me, I'll make you. What happened next was a blur. She sprayed me right in the face. The pain was immediate and intense. I couldn't see, my eyes were burning, and I was struggling to breathe. The store manager heard the commotion and rushed over. He saw me in distress and Karen still ranting and pepper spray in hand. Call the police. The store manager shouted to another employee as he tried to help me. The police arrived quickly and Karen was still there, screaming about her rights and how she was the victim and it was just surreal. The officers arrested her on a spot for assault and I was taken to the hospital and treated for pepper spray exposure. It's crazy, but I'm fine now. Thank God. Living next door to Karen was always an adventure. In the way that living next to an active volcano is an adventure, you never know when things might erupt. And that's why when Karen announced she was building a new house on the piece of land she owns next to my house, the whole neighborhood was anxious. It was a sunny Tuesday morning when the first of the trucks rolled in. I remember because I was enjoying my usual cup of coffee by the window when the peaceful silence was shattered by the sound of heavy machinery. From my vantage point, I could see Karen standing at the edge of her lawn, hands on hips, and surveying the scene. The contractor, Max, arrived shortly after. I had seen contractors before, but Max was different. He had the look of a man who had spent a lifetime turning blueprints into reality. As the construction began, it was impossible not to watch. The ground was broken, foundations were laid, and the structure began to take shape. Karen was omnipresent, a constant figure inside the dust and noise. She wore a hard hat as if it was a crown, directing questions and comments at Max, who handled them with an admirable patience. One day, as I was trimming my hedges, I overheard their first major conversation. Karen's voice was shrill. I want this house to be a masterpiece, Max. It should be a statement. Max nodded. We're on track, Karen, but keep in mind the more complex the design, the higher the cost. Cost seemed to be the last thing on Karen's mind. Money is no object. Just make sure it's perfect. As the days turned into weeks, I saw the skeleton of the house take form. The constant noise of construction became the soundtrack of our neighborhood. Trucks came and went, delivering lumber, bricks and glass. Workers shouted to each other, and so on. But as the house began to take shape, so did the tension. It started with small disagreements. Delays due to weather or the wrong tiles being delivered, Karen's demeanor shifted from enthusiastic to demanding. Max patience, once seemingly infinite, began to wear thin. I remember one particular exchange that took place on a cloudy afternoon. Karen was pointing at the partially completed roof. This isn't what I asked for, Max. The slope is all wrong. It's ruining the atheistic. Max holding the blueprint tried to reason with her. Karen, we followed the design to the letter. Any changes now will set us back weeks. But Karen was unyielding. I don't care about delays. I care about perfection. It was clear to anyone watching that this project, this house, was more than just a structure to Karen. It was a statement, a testament to her taste and status. 
and she was willing to fight for every inch of it, no matter the cost. In I, the unwitting neighbor had a front row seat to the unfolding drama that would soon rock our quiet neighborhood to its core. As days turned into weeks, the construction of Karen's house became the main spectacle of our neighborhood. It was like watching a daily drama unfold right before our eyes. Every morning, I would open my curtains and there it was, the ever-growing structure that was Karen's dream house. But she was just a whirlwind of demands and changes. One afternoon, while I was watering my garden, I overheard another heated conversation between her and Max. Karen said, This isn't what we agreed on, Max. The kitchen layout is all wrong. I need more space, bigger windows, and where is the island I asked for? Max, trying to keep his composure, responded, Karen, we're building exactly what's on the plans. What was the sudden changes? This kind of interaction became the norm. Karen was relentless in her pursuit to perfection, often demanding changes to already completed work, much to Max's frustration. The workers caught in the middle often had to redo parts of the house, leading to delays and increasing costs. The neighborhood started taking bets on how long Max would put up with Karen's antics. We would watch from our windows, whispering and speculating about the latest trauma. The neighborhood was buzzing not just with the sounds of construction, but also with rumors about the escalating tension between Karen and Max, the contractor. Everyone knew something big was about to happen, and none of us wanted to miss it. On sunny morning, as I was pruning my roses, I noticed Karen marching towards the nearly completed house. Max was already there, clipboard in hand, looking more wary than usual. I couldn't help but eavesdrop. Their conversations had become the talk of the neighborhood. Karen started in immediately. Max, this is outrageous. I just got your final bill. And the amount is ridiculous. I'm not paying a penny more than we agreed on. Max sighed. Karen, we've discussed this. The final cost includes all the extra work you requested. Every change you made added to the bill. We can't build a house with this caliber without the appropriate budget. Karen was having none of it. I don't care about your excuses. I'm not paying for your incompetence. You promised me a perfect house. And all I've got were delays and mistakes. Max took a deep breath, trying to keep his cool. Karen, I've been more than patient with you. We've done everything you asked and more. If you refuse to pay, then there is not much I can do. And that's when Karen made a mistake that would become legendary in our neighborhood. She crossed her arms and declared, Fine then, take your house. I won't pay for something I am not happy with. Max's eyes widened, and then a look of resolve took over. All right, Karen, if that's how you want it. The next day, the neighborhood was shocked to see a large wrecking ball being brought onto Karen's property. Max was there directing the operators. Karen came running out of her house, screaming at the top of her lungs. What do you think you're doing, Max? You can't destroy my house. Max turned to her. You said to take my house back, Karen. Since you refused to pay, I'm just doing what you asked. The wrecking ball swung with a tremendous crash, hitting the side of the nicely built house. Wood splintered, glass shattered, then a section of the wall came tumbling down. Karen shrieked, aghast at the destruction going down before her eyes. Everyone was in shock. No one had ever seen anything like this. Karen was in tears, shouting at Max, who was now calmly directing the wrecking crew. The police arrived soon after, and Max and Karen were taken away by the cops. That day became a legend in our neighborhood. The sight of the wrecking ball crashing through Karen's dream house was both horrifying and strangely satisfying. Karen moved away shortly after the incident and a half-destroyed house was eventually torn down. A new family built a much simpler house on the property and life in our little community moved on. Meanwhile, the story of Max and the wrecking ball spread like wildfire. Some sympathized with him, seeing him as a hard-working contractor pushed to the edge by unreasonable demands, and others criticized his drastic actions, arguing that no matter how difficult a client, destruction of property was never justified. This story has a Karen, a Ken, and two very sweet millennial young ladies, who I will call Barbie 1 and Barbie 2. I own a corporation in financial services and insurance that requires me to meet primarily with business owners on a regular basis. I'm providing products that they are required to have, and these are big dollar financial service and insurance products. About 90% of my business is in my office, but about 10% of my clients I will visit in their shops or homes, especially the really top-level clients. 
Last Wednesday, I stopped by one of my clients' place of business. We will call him Eddie. Eddie owns a fancy donut shop that is very popular and has a line around the building every single day. During COVID, his line was literally halfway around the block due to distancing. I came near the end of his rush and I set up some papers in my laptop to the right of his register while he finished the short line that was left. He checked people out on the other side and I was not near the donuts or the customers and I thought nothing of it. This becomes important in a story so I should tell you that I'm a 450 pound guy. I'm big, really big and I'm proud of it. The name calling and the stairs don't bother me. As I waited and continued to pull up the information I'd need for my client, Eddie went in the back to grab some trays of donuts and told the next customers in line, Karen and Ken, that he'd be right back. Apparently, Ken and Karen didn't want to wait as I heard the ever so famous ahem a couple of times before finally looking up at them to see who wasn't responding to them. I didn't think they were trying to get my attention, but they were. I didn't even get a word out and Karen blurted out. How about you get up and help out? We just need half dozen glazed and the other guy disappeared. I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but he just went back to grab some new trays of donuts. He'll be back in just a few minutes. Since I don't work here, I wouldn't have the first clue on how to help you. I'm sorry. Karen literally chuckles out loud, rolls her eyes, shakes her head, and looks at Ken in a he's lying and just being crazy. Then Ken immediately turns his head to me and says, look, buddy, it just needs X donuts. It'll take you 30 seconds and put them in a box and ring us up and you can go back to lounging on your stool. I responded in kind, Well buddy, I don't work here and have no idea how to work the register and help you. Plus, you know, I don't work here and all. Karen now standing behind Ken on her tippy toes like she wants him to go all MMA on me. He looks up and says, Who's your boss? Was it that guy who went to get more donuts or do you have another manager? Again, I tried. Ma'am, I own my own company. I am here on personal business with the owner, Eddie. He's the same gentleman that went in the back, yes, but he's not my boss. I really do not work here. Just then, Eddie comes back out, slides the new trays in and asks Karen and Ken if he can help them. Karen, leaning hands and rests, first on the counter says to Eddie, Yeah, you can stop hiring lazy fat people who don't want to help your customers. What do you do? Pay him in crawlers? This made Eddie very confused and I spoke up and said to him, This woman thinks I work here because I'm behind the counter. I tried to tell her I didn't, but supposedly, I'm too fat and too lazy not to work here or something. Anyway, they want half a dozen of something. Eddie turns to Karen and Ken and asks if they were being rude. They started to speak, but thankfully, Barbie 1 and Barbie 2 came to my defense. They were in line behind Karen and Ken and had heard the whole ordeal. They started speaking up, explaining that these people were awful, rude, and just plain mean. After hearing that, Eddie simply kicked them out and told them not to come back and that they are banned. Why don't they believe someone who says they don't work there? It's so strange and of course, now that it's over, all of the great comebacks are in my head as I missed. But I'll be ready next time if it happens again. But I'll be ready next time if it happens again. In September of 2020, the apartment next to mine was let out to two young women, both students. After they settled in a bit, it turned out they wanted to have a party. No big deal, except Belgium was in full lockdown at this point due to COVID. And you were supposed to only have one fixed visitor over, a then again, to be young again, and so on, so I didn't really care. During this time, I was working in healthcare. I work with the mentally disabled but I volunteered for the AD hot COVID team. Meaning I got called upon to tend to those residents who were sick and needed quarantining or were effectively diagnosed with COVID. This meant pretty long working hours and I spent about 10 to 11 hours a day at work with a full hour bike ride to and from work. Needless to say, I was pretty tired pretty much all the time. So I wasn't looking forward to the noise from a party, but I'm pretty chill and know that living in the city, some noise is to be expected. So they are having their party and I can stand some noise and music. But this party was wild. People shouting full on in the hallway, breaking things and so on and so on. At about 4 in the morning, I introduced myself to the neighbors and asked them when they could expect their company, 20 plus people, to leave. 
and if they could refrain from having a party the next day, as I have to work and get up at 6 every day. So they promised they would keep it down the rest of the night. They didn't. And that they wouldn't have a party the next day. Plot twist? They did have another party. And then did another one the day after. At this point, I had been going a full three nights without sleep. I was nearing neurosis. Every night I had talked to the girls and every night they would be all of apologies and stuff. But nothing would change. I also felt terrible when I had to enter their place because it would be absolutely packed with people and I work with some very vulnerable people at work who I wouldn't want to spread COVID to. This was pre-tests, pre-vaccines, pretty much of the knowledge we now have about COVID. Luckily, the weekend came and they went to their parents and I could recover a bit. Suffice to say, I wasn't really liking my new neighbors. During the next few weeks, they refrained from big parties, but they would have a constant flood of people coming over during the night. And by constant, I mean constant. Like their bell would ring 70 times a night and people would always be coming or going. And those people would be drunk and loud. Our communal hallway is pretty much an echo chamber because it's all stone and any noise will travel throughout the building. Basically, I couldn't rely on sleep at night. It drove me crazy. I could only sleep Friday through Sunday because then they would go off to their parents or whatever. I couldn't grasp how they could know this many people that would always be coming and going. One night, while knocking on their door to complain about the noise, I encountered my upstairs neighbor, who is also on Reddit. Hi. And decided that we would have to join forces to get this to stop. My neighbor told me some important bit of information. The reason there were people coming and going all the time was because they used their apartment as a makeshift bar slash hangout. During this time, bars were closed due to COVID and all those students were using the big apartment to hang out. Moreover, across the street was another frat house with five boys living there. And that too was a secret hangout. So people would hang out at those two places and cross the street if they wanted a different atmosphere or wanted to see their other friends and so on. And the boys from across the street would also come over 15 times a night. Most visitors seemed to be law students or affiliated with them. Basically, our communal hallway was just a part of their cafe space now. So we tried talking to the girls. Then we started to talk to the visitors. None of them had any sympathy for us when we were asking them to be quiet at 4 in the morning. Most of them just laughed at us, as we were the bisky neighbors, no doubt. Even more of them were just so wasted that they didn't know what they were even doing. So we started calling the police dozens of times. Most of the time they weren't let in and the police told us they couldn't do anything. We kept calling as we wanted a record of our calls in the system. Belgium was still in full lockdown at this point and what they were doing was illegal. Even so, the police told us their hands were tied if they wouldn't open the door. When the police couldn't tell by turn to the next best thing. I'm a social worker and so I have no problems looking up information and calling around to look for help. This is what I did. Most places, student unions, police, town hall were understanding but couldn't really do much. So I acted on a suggestion of the upstairs neighbor and contacted one of the girls, Dean. I sent him a nice email about sorry for bothering him and taking up his time, but I had this big group of students from his faculty ganging up every night and maybe he wanted to know about it since they were breaking every possible COVID rule that existed at the time. Especially since me and my neighbor were about to go to the papers with this story. As secret lockdown parties were becoming a thing in the papers at this point, this dean called me back right away and we had a nice talk about our problems. He told me he was on it. So basically what he did was call the law student girl and her parents. Big drama ensued and we finally got to sit down with the girls and they finally sounded like they were sorry. Tears were shed, for which I had no patience by the way. We learned that the police had actually been inside a few times and they were issued tickets for having secret parties. Those were 300 euro each a pop. So no idea why they didn't just stop. We learned that they were not happy because the dean had called them up at 11 o'clock and they were still asleep. To which I said, well, there is your problem. You are still asleep at 11 o'clock. I'm up at 6 every day and you girls haven't been a bit understanding about that. So we got to feel a bit like we got our revenge and we got to vent. But we kept it kinda nice and parted on good terms. 
hoping that this would be it, that we could live together as nice neighbors. But if that were the case, I wouldn't be here, right? You'd think they would have gotten the point now. I would refrain from making noise and partying. Well, you'd be wrong. Basically, what they did was they moved to the frat's house across the street and started partying there. There were slightly less people running to and from, but the noise was still a problem and we were now in the middle of the second COVID wave and these people were meeting up with big groups like crazy. Why all I hadn't seen a soul in almost a year? Never mind the people at my work who were forbidden from even going to their own freaking family. The whole thing was just ridiculous. My upstairs neighbor happened to film such a party across the street and had sent the clip to me. We were thinking about going to the press with our story but weren't really sure if it would be a good idea. So I posted the clip of the party on a subreddit of our country to test the waters. It got quite some comments and upvotes and it seemed most people were also sick of people disregarding the rules and having secret parties. After some talks with the upstairs neighbor, we decided to contact the press and simultaneously go up a step in the university hierarchy and contact the vice rector that had the power to start up a disciplinary case against the students. This person is one of 12 vice rectors for a total campus of about 15 southern students, so quite high up. Things moved fast. Local news actually picked up our story from Reddit and contacted me. We gave some background information. They confirmed with the police that cops have been to our address dozens of times and across the street that weren't lit in most of the time. We mentioned that the university was involved and that we hoped they would finally intervene. The next day, the piece was on their website. It went viral there and got promoted to the sites of most national newspapers. Its headline was sensational enough, mentioning that dozens of times police had shown up and also mentioning how healthcare workers were being kept up by selfish students. At the same time, the vice rector contacted us to take our statements which we already had prepared up on paper and informed us they would investigate and could possibly start disciplinary actions. At the same time, more reporters were contacting me throughout the day and we made sure to mention that to her and link the university to the printed articles. The next day, while at work, I got a message from the upstairs neighbor that a film crew from the national news was at our doorstep. He declined to talk to them and I would have done the same since this was getting pretty big now but they made a segment anyway. And sure enough, that night at 7, here was my street and a short section about cops standing in front of a closed door a dozen times and a local press cop talking about the troubles of closed doors. Best part about it was that a student from the offending frat house across the street had led the film crew in and said on camera exactly what we were accusing them of towards the university. That they had been having parties and didn't let the cops in and that they had done it multiple times. No idea what made him think that was a good idea, but oh well. Anyway, trying not to make a huge story even longer, the press died down some time later, thank god, and a disciplinary action from the university went through. Before the hearing, we sat down with the girls from our block and cleared some things up. We wanted to live like normal people together and we tried to make some amends because we put in a kind of good word for them, they got the lighter end of the stick. 40 hours of community service and some probation. The guys across the street got 80 hours each and each had to write us a letter of apology, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading every time I got one. Sad part is, most of them sounded just like dumb young kids, but that was after getting called out on the news and being part of a disciplinary action. But we never wanted to escalate things this far. Some noise is to be expected when living in the same building and we were never going to go to these extremes for some expected noises. But these people went to the extremes and so we were forced to do the same. Rest of the year, a simple message on WhatsApp was enough to silence any noises we had coming from their apartment. If anything, I hope they learned that even very polite and chilled people can become very upset when presented with sleep deprivation and excessive noise. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.